Christmas, the storm is coming fast, the day will soon be here. When those who are caught unprepared will be the first to fall, that much is clear. Hello and welcome to Physical Attraction, the Teot Wauki specials, where we'll be examining the end of the world, one apocalypse at a time. And survive while there's people crying, people dying everywhere around. Hello and thank you for joining me. It's another episode of the Teot Wauki specials of Physical Attraction. And today we're going to be talking about the Malthusian Catastrophe, in an episode that I've entitled Malthus's Revenge. So today we're travelling back in time to the 18th century to address a crisis that's perhaps fairly obvious, and seems likely to reoccur over and over again throughout human history. So when they teach you about differential equations in physics, the ones that govern how things evolve in time, the classic system that they like to set up to illustrate coupled differential equations, that is where the two quantities influence each other, is a predator-prey model. So this is the kind of equation that can determine, say, how populations of rabbits, foxes and cabbages might evolve over time, in a world where the rabbits get eaten by the foxes and the cabbages get eaten by the rabbits. Now humans have engineered the world so that we have very few natural predators left. Our population is no longer really linked to the number of predators available. So instead, for many years, it does what these differential equations tell you it will do. It's grown. Without upper limits, you might say, for the sake of argument, that the number of humans born each year is 1 50th of the total population. The actual figures are 19 births per thousand population, which is close to a 50th. And the number of humans dying each year is around 8 out of a thousand. So the growth rate of the human population is roughly the human population itself divided by a hundred. Whenever in mathematics you get a growth rate for a quantity proportional to the quantity itself, the result of that, the solution to that equation, is an exponential. Another way of putting this is that any quantity that grows by a certain percentage and not a certain amount annually, that's exponential growth. So if you get an interest rate on your bank account that grows by a percentage of its own value a year, that's exponential growth and the population of the world is growing at a rate of around 1% a year, which means you'd expect it to double every 70 years if current trends continue. Exponential growth is very, very powerful. It's actually an upper limit to what naturally growing phenomena can accomplish. The exponential itself was discovered via compound interest, and if you have a calculator, you can derive it for yourself in a very similar way. Let's suppose I have an amazingly generous bank account that gives me 100% interest every year. By the way, if I did have that, I wouldn't be writing this podcast, but instead doing everything in my power to put more money into this magic bank account. But let's say I have it, and let's say I start with a pound. If the interest is compounded once, at the end of the year, I'll double that and I'll have two pounds. But what if the interest is compounded twice, once every six months, so each time I get 50% interest on what I've earned? Now, you're obviously going to earn more money, because the second time they compound the interest you'll earn interest on your interest. So, this is, you know, an example of the joys of capitalism for those who have money to begin with. So in this case, we work it out by incrementing by 50%, and then by another 50%, which is the same as multiplying by 1.5 squared. So you can see that after six months, I have £1.50 in my bank account, and then I get 50% more of that, which is another 75p. So I now have £2.25, as opposed to just the £2 if they compounded once magic. So you can carry on doing this. If the interest gets compounded 10 times a year, with 10% each time, that's the same as multiplying by 1.1 to the power of 10. That gives me £2.59. And if you carry on doing this, shrinking the percentage and increasing the number of times you compound the interest, then the growth doesn't continue forever, it actually tends towards a limit. And eventually you tend towards this limit, and the limit is that you have nearly £2.72. That's e pounds, where e is the exponential. Exponential growth is a very powerful thing. There's a story of a wily old advisor to a king who gave the king a nice shiny new chessboard. When the king asked what he wanted in return for the gift, he said, I'd just like some rice, please. Put one grain of rice on the first square, two grains on the second square, four on the third square, and so on. The king agreed, because obviously he hated maths at school, and then quickly found himself needing to find a trillion grains of rice for the 41st square on the chessboard. The total amount of grains he'd need for all 64 squares would be 18 quintillion, 446 quadrillion, 744 trillion, 73 billion, 709 million, 
551,615. The king was learning a valuable lesson. Exponential growth will eventually outstrip any available resources. We see this with bacteria on a plate of agar jelly too. Initially, if you throw a couple down, it's great for the bacteria. They have as much food as they want, no predators, and the population grows exponentially. But eventually, they can't divide uncontrollably anymore. They run out of resources, and their waste products start to choke them. It's one of the simplest population models you can come up with. But since it's so simple, does it accurately reflect something as complicated as the human race? Here's an amazing back-of-the-envelope calculation you can do about the power of exponential growth. I found it when I was researching this, and I, th I think it's amazing. It comes courtesy of Tom Murphy's blog post at UCSD, and I urge you to read the original because he explains it in a very amusing way. So imagine that human energy consumption, in any form but including electricity, grows by 2.3% a year. That's actually a little bit less than it is at the moment. It's been growing at 3% a year pretty faithfully for a long time. And, you know, that's for reasons that there are more humans around and also humans consume more all the time. If this happens, in just 400 years, the entire planet will reach 100 degrees Celsius, the boiling point of water. And this has absolutely nothing to do with the greenhouse effect and carbon dioxide emissions either. This isn't global warming in the traditional sense. It's simply that in any process there's always waste heat generated, and the waste heat alone will be enough to boil the planet in 400 years. In 1400 years, although obviously humans would be absolutely toast by then, this theoretical increase would lead the Earth to output more energy than the Sun. So what Tom Murphy is saying is that Obviously, we can't have energy consumption continue to grow exponentially forever, because exponential growth leads to just ridiculous phenomena. There would be things outputting heat on every part of the Earth's surface, and the planet would literally boil. So the idea that we can have exponential growth in any field that goes on forever is, um, is completely unrealistic. Now, the human population has been growing exponentially for a very long time. It's been continuously growing since the Black Death in the 1300s, although not always exponentially. And although wars, famines and plagues do cause occasional blips in the growth since, it's been pretty close to exponential since the Industrial Revolution kicked off. Now, Malthus was not the only one to notice this before I get letters, but he's indisputably the one who has his name most closely associated with the concept. So Malthus, among others, saw this in the 1790s and said, oh boy. He was afraid that the human population would overshoot the availability of resources, and then things would really hit the fan. He said, quote, Famine seems to be the last, the most dreadful resource of nature. The power of population is so superior to the power of the earth to produce subsistence for man, that premature death must in some shape or other visit the human race. The vices of mankind are able and active ministers of depopulation. They are the precursors in the great army of destruction, and often finish the dreadful work themselves. But should they fail in this war of extermination, sickly seasons, epidemics, pestilence and plague advance in terrific array, and sweep off their thousands and tens of thousands? Should success still be incomplete, gigantic inevitable famine stalks in the rear, and with one mighty blow, levels the population with the world of food? Which sounds pretty apocalyptic. I mean, if you imagine the kind of carnage that could happen under these circumstances, especially with modern weaponry, you can see that it would be a dangerous time for civilization. Malthus himself sounds very depressed about it. And, after all, as we keep saying, we're just a few square meals away from barbarism at any one time. Now, I'm not going to be able to talk about Malthus without mentioning that, since the day this has been discussed, it's been used by an excuse by all kinds of people who want to propose all kinds of solutions, many of which are very unsavoury. Malthus himself wanted to use this argument to encourage mass abstinence, and, you know, where's the fun in that? And Malthus also used his argument to discourage charitable giving to the poor, and against some of the liberal reforms that were beginning to happen, slowly, in Britain, in the Victorian era. The argument being that if famine and plague weren't allowed to naturally cull the population of the poor, then his catastrophe would inevitably follow. Which, to our ears, sounds horrendous. But still other people in the modern era want to use it as a justification for eugenics, selectively breeding humans to produce the best possible results, or limiting the rights of others. And we all know where that leads, we've seen that in history. There is this immensely patronising undertone to a lot of Malthusianism that's founded in a very dark, very nasty place. One thing to note is that a lot of people are perfectly happy for those who consume and waste the most resources on the planet, per head, 
and if you're listening to this podcast, that's probably you, to remain alive and free to reproduce as they will, while those who don't are to be punished for the excess of everyone else. I think we have to view the right to reproduce as a fundamental human right, and we can't start messing around with those if we want our society to retain any semblance of freedom. It may frustrate you to see people who are bad parents being allowed to have children, but the alternative, which would be denying people the right to reproduce, is unthinkable. I mean, in many ways, you can argue that this is the biological purpose of being alive, to reproduce, and so denying people that is denying them one of the most fundamental parts of life. So, by all means, if it concerns you, these groups should be working towards encouraging people to think about birth control, family planning, contraception, things like that. But I don't think we can ever enter into the realms of actively limiting people and still look ourselves in the eye as a species. I mean, this would end in tears as surely as a Malthusian catastrophe would. I also, I genuinely don't believe that you can ever really put the bunny back in the box like Nicolas Cage would want us to do. I'm not a fan of the fact that there are thousands of nuclear weapons everywhere that could kill us all at a moment's notice, but I accept that it's very, very difficult to get rid of them, and maybe more dangerous to get rid of them than it is to keep them. Globalisation has had its upsides and downsides, as people are currently acknowledging. It really depends on the metric you use to measure, and which country's population you're most concerned with, let's be honest. But I don't think it can be halted, or even really slowed down significantly. I mean, look at the efforts of people who are trying. Do you think they're succeeding? More on this later. But human population is far from the only thing that we'd like to continue growing exponentially. If you think about it, we've all been born at a simply insane point in history. For the first million years or so of our species, life would have been exactly the same for everyone, from birth to death, hunter-gathering in small societies. You know, they found the tomb of one hunter-gatherer once, and they seemed to think that there was actually a hierarchy involved, because of the number of grave goods that he had. So this was a man with many, many, many bracelets and so on. And they thought, okay, he must have been the equivalent of their king in the hunter-gatherer society. So maybe if you were a hunter-gatherer king, you might get slightly better bits of carcass. But I mean, aside from that, life is the same for everyone. Even after agriculture began around 12,000 years ago, and cities began to be built, for a long time things were broadly the same. And you can talk to people who think that the agricultural revolution was a bad idea as well, in terms of the quality of living for the average person. But the point is that the pace of change was slow. The world then was far more immutable, far more unchangeable, and had lasted for far longer in a stable equilibrium than the world we have today. So why do we feel confident that the world we have today is the final form? I mean, America has been around since 1776. They've been a global superpower since maybe 1945. The Roman Empire was a global superpower for hundreds of years, and even that fell, as we all know. But in the last 300 years or so, everything has gone completely insane. It's been accelerating at an absurd pace for a long time. It's no longer broadly possible to predict what the world will look like, what day-to-day -day human life will look like in 50 years. For the vast majority of human history, this simply hasn't been true. And, you know, if you look, talk to people who are trying to investigate things like the future of humanity, a lot of them will tell you how critical this time is. They'll say that they'll give you 50-50 odds that the human race will make it to the end of the 21st century. Now, you might say that that's pessimistic, attention-seeking, whatever, and I'm going to do some shows on it at some point. But the thing is, for the vast majority of human history, that simply hasn't been true either. There's never been the potential for the human race to wipe itself out before the last 50 or 60 years. We all accept the realities with which we're presented, of course, but things have become unimaginably complex in ways we might accept, but can never truly understand. And the world turns. Our consumption is growing exponentially too. The great driver of humanity, the itch that pushed us out of the oceans and down from the trees, the hole in our hearts that can never be filled, the wants and needs that can never be sated. The more people have, the more they desire. And the more they desire, the more that has to be invented to sate them, and the more they must consume. No one said that evolution had to produce beings that were psychologically well-adjusted. Maybe the best beings it can produce, in terms of surviving, are the ones who will never be happy, who will never be satisfied, who will always want more. After all, if you are easily satisfied, then you're far more likely to fall prey to some predator or other. You know, that kind of argument. Is it true? I really don't know. Like everything else, like so much of physics, 
This is an overly simplistic picture. It gives us hints at reality, but can never hope to describe it all. There's just enough poetic license in there that you should be very suspicious of how truthful it is. And yet, if you can find some people who are happy with what they have, and always will be, I'd love to meet them. I can point you to some billionaires who remain as desperate for something to fill the void in their hearts as ever they were. Our economic system is founded on endless growth. This is embedded in the very nature of interest rates, the compound interest that led people to discover exponential growth in the first place. If the economy fails to grow by a certain number of percentage points per year, there is panic, and a lot of people get very jumpy. If this carries on indefinitely, the system of loans, interest rates and so on must eventually collapse. So the Malthusian catastrophe argument can be simply transplanted to economics as well. What happens when our need for growth outstrips the resources available? Can we really have everything founded on psychology and perception with no assets? A lot of people have been asking this question. And much like Malthus's theories, they can be used to prop up your own political and philosophical beliefs if you want to use it that way. People will point to impending ecological and environmental catastrophe as a necessary consequence of our desire for limitless economic growth. But is this in fact the case? Are we wrong when we draw this dichotomy when we say the environment or the economy pick one? Is it just a case of mismanagement, carelessness, greed about the rate of growth? Can you have limitless economic growth on a finite planet? Or will our hunger for more inevitably consume everything? So I should point out, Malthus was wrong. Or at least he was wrong in the specifics of his argument. He predicted that this catastrophe was going to manifest itself in the 1850s. This might have been true, but the rate of food production also increased. Technological developments in the 20th century, collectively called the Green Revolution, allowed humans to produce more and more food. This included things like widespread mechanisation, irrigation of agriculture, the use of chemical fertilisers and pesticides, and selective breeding of crops like wheat into higher and higher yield varieties. Production of cereal crops doubled between 1961 and 1985 because of these methods, far outstripping the rate of growth of the world population in that time. And Malthus's catastrophe was, broadly speaking, avoided. 36 million people a year, and this should never be understated, 36 million people a year die due to a lack of food, or indirectly through malnutrition. But this is not down to a lack of food available. There's more than enough food available. It's just poorly distributed. And the widespread famine that Malthus predicted did not materialise. His followers in future generations have also had their predictions fail. Paul Ehrlich, in his book The Population Bomb, predicted that hundreds of millions would starve to death in India due to a kind of Malthusian overshoot. But it did not occur. The Green Revolution outpaced Malthus. It has come in for criticism too, but it's very arguable that the benefits outweigh the costs. One of the pioneers of the Green Revolution, Norman Borlaug, had a very stinging response to his critics. He said, quote, Some of the environmental lobbyists of Western nations are salt of the earth, but many of them are elitists. They've never experienced the physical sensation of hunger. They do their lobbying from comfortable office suites in Washington or Brussels. If they lived just one month amid the misery of the developing world, as I have for 50 years, they'd be crying out for tractors and fertiliser and irrigation canals, and be outraged that the fashionable elitists back home were trying to deny them these things. End quote. Agronomers who study the world potential for agriculture have even suggested that if land use was completely optimised, the world might be capable of supporting 30 to 40 billion humans. And that is only with current technology and current projections. You could imagine that you could have vertical farms, hydroponics, things like that, that would make it so much easier for us to produce so much more food. Of course, if you were going to completely optimise the land use and support those 30 to 40 billion humans, it would come with a decrease in freedom, because you'd have to dictate to all of the landowners, if there are any left, exactly what to grow, when and how to grow it. And you'd have to tell all of the humans precisely what they can and can't eat. And they'd have to avoid wasting everything and like it. Chances are that the main change would be a move away from eating meat, because meat is a far less efficient use of the calories from agriculture. You can dispute the exact numbers, and believe me, people online have exaggerated them in both directions. But direct eating crops, rather than using them to feed animals, who then waste some of that energy, is almost certainly more efficient. There's, there's no argument about that. But like the other proposed solution to a Malthusian crisis, it will prove unacceptable and probably unenforceable for some. 
Even now, with land use far from optimal though, we're producing enough calories to feed 9 billion people. The fact that the world's 7 billion people are not all fed properly is down to waste and a failure of distribution. I suppose distribution will never be perfect, and I don't think we can rely on improved distribution in the future, if, which is the great caveat, if current trends continue. Most people think that the world population is going to level out and won't continue to exponentially grow for a number of different reasons. One, yes, is that the food supply is naturally limited. But we also have an increase in standard of living for many, and this almost invariably brings with it fewer children for all kinds of reasons. People live longer, so a greater fraction of the population is not at reproductive age. Women's rights and reproductive rights become more important. Contraception and family planning become more important. If the average age of the population increases, the death rate will also grow relative to the birth rate. And if people no longer need children as instruments of financial security to the same extent, then they will have fewer children. Already in a lot of Western countries which have seen the greatest increases in standard of living, the population is in decline and birth rates are levelling out. Increased prosperity for the whole world might solve the exponential growth problem in population, although we don't know what it will do about the consumption problem about the limitless economic growth problem. This then brings us to the fundamental conflict about people who are scared of Malthus's revenge and people who are optimistic about the future. In a pure Malthusian sense, you view the world as growing into a finite space of resources and eventually the resources will be exhausted and you'll get a catastrophe. But in the view of what you might call the progress optimists, it's more like a race between our growing consumption and our growing capacity. Innovation can drive up our ability to produce, just like the Green Revolution did, and resources that once seemed finite can suddenly be effectively infinite. After all, what is an effective infinity? It's just somewhere you can't get to because it's running away from you too quickly. So maybe the next revolution is GM crops, hydroponic farming, vertical farming. The economy may be driven by the development of new technologies and new industries that are currently unthinkable, but might one day provide the engines for economic growth. Who could have said 20 years ago that there'd be app industries and app owners that so many people would uh, depend on for their livelihoods and jobs? And the efficiency with what we use, what we do have, could be improved. Just like the Green Revolution basically increased the efficiency of how we use land and the sun's rays. The more humans there are, the more people are researching and developing new technologies, the more collective brain power the human race has. So improvement also has a feedback loop built in. You can imagine, you can see how it works really. As the population gets larger, there are more and more people who have more and more choice to specialise, and as that occurs, you're going to get better and better developments. So in Tom Murphy's blog post that we talked about earlier, which he called Exponential Economist Meets Finite Physicist, one of the solutions proposed to the problem of using so much energy that you boil the planet was simple. Imagine that technology causes us to shift into lifestyles that consume less energy, Say we all end up plugged into the virtual reality matrix 24-7, and we no longer need to consume resources as much. It could happen. Would you put it past the universe? When Adam Smith and other early economists talked out their theories of growth, they recognised that there were physical limits on how much growth was possible, but they thought it would be limited by the finite availability of land on Earth. But this hasn't proved to be the limiting factor for economic growth, even though not all of the land is fully exploited yet. It's clear that there are fundamental limits to how long things can continue to grow exponentially, because of just what a ridiculous thing exponential growth is. If you let it go long enough, it will become absurd and it will have to stop. Even innovations that lead to increased efficiency can't continue forever, because there are thermodynamic limits to how efficient any process can be. That's just fundamental physics, folks. So efficiency is not going to save you. There is going to be, have to be some kind of adjustment. But it need not be dramatic. If the population does gradually level out for social reasons and reasons of prosperity, rather than through external controls or famine, we might avoid the catastrophe. And those limits to our production might be so far off that they're practically irrelevant. Make no mistake though, anyone who tries to tell you that overpopulation and the Malthusian catastrophe is inevitable and it's going to destroy us all and soon, I think these people are just as deluded as the techno-optimists who say that endless growth can continue forever. In physics, when a solution doesn't depend on time, when things stop, or when they're in equilibrium with each other, we say that it's a steady-state solution. 
It seems to me that the human race is heading for another steady-state solution, where things won't change in time so much as they do now, and it's going to look very different to the way things do today. At some point in the future, it will again be possible to predict what life will be like for humans a thousand years from now. Whether that's because we've advanced to some kind of godlike state that's stable, or whether that's because we've all been killed, who knows? I mean, this world could well be a type of paradise. Imagine it, human progress no longer pegged to numbers like the FTSE and the Dow Jones. Imagine that things like wealth need to continue growing forever for human civilization to continue, or maybe that is just down to a lack of imagination that we think that wealth needs to continue to grow. Maybe we will start measuring things in terms of human happiness, the quality of life. And maybe the quality of life will one day decouple from these metrics. It won't be associated with the stock market anymore. And after all, a lot of them are defined by human psychology in a lot of ways. A steady state could look like a utopia, where we work to meet ever higher needs in Maslow's hierarchy of needs, where things get better and better for everyone, without people necessarily needing to consume more. But for now... We're nowhere near that imagined utopia. The reality is that we're locked in a struggle, in a race, between our growing consumption of resources and our growing desire for growth, and the changing limits of the possible. And to me at least, it's not at all clear who's going to win, or what the world would look like when someone does. Is the adjustment coming? Yes. Do we know when? Not really. Do we know what it will look like? Not really but it could be catastrophic. Is it fascinating to think about? Of course. That's why I did a whole episode on it. Thanks for listening to Physical Attraction, the Teot Wauki special. If you've got any questions or concerns, if you've got any opinions on overpopulation or the Malthusian catastrophe, I imagine that there might be some political opinions on this, then you can tweet us at physicspod. Uh, please leave us a rate and review on iTunes and tell your friends who might be interested in the end of the world. You know, it's probably going to affect us all at some point. Um, Tell them to listen and uh, see what they think. And uh, aside from the Twitter, we're on Facebook, and you can email us at physicspod at outlook.com. Next week, we'll be dealing with another apocalypse. Until then, stay safe. You better make some preparations. There's no time for hesitation. Our theme music is Get Ready for the Apocalypse by Astrometrics. Get ready.